The year is 1986, and the Nintendo Entertainment System is the king of video games. Arcades started to feel the same pressure cinemas must have felt with the invention of TV and the appearance of cable broadcasting. Who's going to come to the movies, or go to the arcade, when they can get that entertainment at home? Three years before, the Nintendo Entertainment System took the world by storm and single-handedly spurred a recovery of the video game market which came crashing down that year. The Atari, once proudly standing atop of the video game console market, was a shadow of what it once was. Many other video game consoles simply disappeared altogether. Game development studios closed their doors, and the popularity of the home console was lost for a good two years before the Nintendo brought it all back, slowly but surely, through vendor control and desirable games. By 1986, the video game market was well recovered, and seemingly everyone was playing Nintendo. And Nintendo themselves made some of the most popular games for their own system, and one of them was released in August of 1986. It was a simple game by today's standards, but the time, it caused a sensation. In more ways than one. It was a side-scrolling science fiction adventure featuring an interplanetary bounty hunter on a mission to fight space pirates on the planet Zebas and destroy their leader, the Mother Brain. It was called Metroid, and it was groundbreaking in the size of its world, the complexity of the gameplay, the variety of things you could do, and the weapons and items you can use were enormous. While the word epic is often overused, for 1986, Metroid was an epic game. The planet Zebes was massive, and you could go pretty much anywhere you wished. If you got into an area that was far too difficult for you, then you knew there were some items in another area that you'd need to collect to survive. Open world games are pretty common now, but in the 8-bit era, this was something brand new. But I mentioned that Metroid caused a sensation in more ways than one. It wasn't just the gameplay, it wasn't just the freedom you felt moving around or the awesome weaponry you could use against your enemies. No, it was because you played through this game as the bounty hunter called Samus Aran, known throughout the galaxy for danger and cunning. You went on a grand adventure on an alien planet and conquered the evil space pirates. And it was only at the end that you discovered that Samus Aran is a woman. I'm Daniel Messer, the cyberpunk librarian. Welcome to Generating X. Video games have always drawn upon classic themes and stories, and the games for the Nintendo Entertainment System were no different. They built their foundations upon these stories. They've retold fairy tales and presented classic stories to us in a new, interactive way. Within the Castlevania games, you're battling against a literary villain in the character of Dracula. Ghosts and Goblins plays on our darker fears and features biblical villains like the Devil and Satan. Yes, both of them, because video games. Then there are the damsels in distress. Super Mario Brothers features a princess, dressed in pink, who is captured by a dragon-like figure. The Legend of Zelda is high fantasy, where, once again, you need to rescue a princess. Just as it is in countless stories, the female character is an object of desire, and often in need of rescue. Metroid came along and upended this entire idea. Some games are named after the hero, while some are named after the setting, or the villain. Metroid is named after an alien life form the player doesn't even come across until closer to the end of the game. For those who've not played, the Metroid is a sort of jellyfish-like creature that can float through the air. It doesn't have tendrils or arms like a jellyfish, instead it's got a beak underneath it that's more like an octopus. Metroids are parasitic creatures that can consume life energy, so the space pirates are working on them as a bioweapon. However, it's discovered later that Metroids can return that energy, which could make them a living power source. They're not evil, they're just an animal that smarter animals want to exploit for their own ends. 
But let's get back to the hero of our story, Samus Aran. Keep in mind that back in the late 80s, there was no internet. Computer bulletin board systems, and we'll cover those at some point, were mostly local and used only by techies and geeks. So it wasn't like one could just hop online and discover shocking things about video game characters or movies or anything else. So while players were finishing the game and discovering the true secret of Metroid, they couldn't share the information all that quickly and The Legend of Samus Aran, a female bounty hunter, spread slowly at best. Samus Aran is one of those names that tells you nothing. Unlike Jennifer or Samuel or Bridget or Joseph, Samus Aran doesn't give away a gender. Given that video gamers were finding their way through an alien world, blasting things with missiles, destroying monsters with an arm cannon, and jumping and diving their way into sci-fi adventure, I bet everyone figured they were playing a male character. After all, there wasn't anything like this before, which is one of the many reasons Samus Aran is special. After taking down two high-ranking space pirates, Ridley and Kraid, she goes on to destroy the Mother Brain. While we can assume that Mother Brain is also female, she's presented more as an evil artificial intelligence, a literal giant brain that doesn't belie anything one would consider womanly or feminine or anything else other than just being a giant brain. Freudian issues about moms aside, Mother Brain was called Mazaburain in Japanese, and depending on what you read at the time, Mother Brain could be a mistranslation and her name could have been Master Brain. Either way, while the game supposedly had a female villain, no one seemed to care about that. The shocking part came right after beating the game, which was an epic battle even for the time. After destroying Mother Brain, Samus had to make her way up a shaft, jumping on tiny platforms while a countdown timer ran in the background, because the death of Mother Brain set off a self-destruct sequence. Then, after reaching the elevator and arriving on the surface of the planet, well, what happened next depended on how long it took you to beat the game. See, this was another groundbreaking event in video games. Metroid was one of the first video games with multiple endings. So, depending on how long it took you to beat the game, you'd see a different ending. One ending simply gave you some congratulatory text and Samus waved to you while wearing her suit. If you beat it more quickly than that, you get the beginning of the surprise endings as Samus would take off her helmet, revealing a long-haired woman underneath. Beat the game in a shorter amount of time and she'd remove the entire exo armor suit revealing a woman in what amounted to be a one-piece swimsuit a look that came to be known as her Zero Suit. And there was no denying at that point that you just lived through a fantastic adventure in outer space through the eyes of a woman. It wasn't all feminism, though. After all, if you race through the game in under an hour, you get the quote-unquote best ending where she removes her suit and stands before you in a two-piece bikini and a pair of boots. Also, it should be noted that the decision to make Samus Aran a woman came about halfway through the development of the game, when the developers just decided it would be a cool thing to do. There wasn't an underlying message of female empowerment, it was simply something they decided to do. Still, the impact of the female hero in a video game reverberated throughout the entire industry from 1986 until this very day. Samus was the first, and while the best ending may have ended up with her in a two-piece, eight-bit bikini, she never gave anything away during the game itself. She was the dangerous warrior taking on a bigger foe. And Lara Croft, Bayonetta, Aveline de Grand Pre, Cortana, and Aya Bray, they all owe a little bit to a hero from the past whose story took place in the future. Next year sometime, Nintendo will be releasing its new console currently referred to as the Nintendo NX, though that name could, and probably will, change. I'm sure there'll be a new Mario game, and probably something from the land of Hyrule with a new Legend of Zelda. There will be princesses in both, most likely. But as a lifelong fan of a certain galactic bounty hunter, I really hope there's a new Metroid game too. It's been far too long, and it's time for Samus Aran to make a return.
Generating X would like to thank the Internet Archive at archive.org for hosting this show, so many other shows like it, and other shows that are not like this at all. Check them out at thearchive.org where you'll find great content from podcasts to ebooks to video games, software, all kinds of great stuff. If you've never bothered to check them out, I really suggest you do. Check out the Internet Archive at archive.org. Earlier in the show, you heard Pumped by Rocco W, and the opening track is Bacterial Love by Roll Music. You can uh, hit the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Look for this episode, episode one of Generating X, and you can find links to download those if you like from the free music archive. If you'd like to reach out and get in touch with me, well, you can do so in a multiple different ways. You can hit me up on Twitter, where I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also join the conversation at Facebook.com slash Cyberpunk Librarian. And if you'd like to listen to your audio in a video way, well, you can get this at YouTube.com slash Cyberpunk Librarian. And as always, drop me an email at cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you, and thank you so much for tuning in.